Um, and hello to the people out there. I can't see you, so I don't know who's there. Um, yeah, my name is Neil Green. I've been um, with the zoo since about 2012, or since the 2012. And just uh, I'll go through what we're going to sort of talk about in a minute. But generally, it's not everything we do. Um, it's just sort of, sort of like a snapshot of a few of the projects and um, bits of those projects as well, because it's just vast. So it's, it'd be longer than 45 minutes. So um, that's it. And yeah, so conservation in the community. And it's a Bristol story. So um, we're moving sort of like out a bit more and a bit further afield. But in the main, a lot of my work has been with community groups um, on riverbanks in Bristol and in parish council uh, meetings and in churches and giving presentations all different places at the Bristol Festival of Nature etc so so yeah a real sort of Bristol centric kind of role really um, in the main so just <clears throat> like I said what I'm going to talk about um, one just generally the problem um, I'm sure majority of you know about invasive species and have heard about certain ones and um, we are kind of touching on mainly the classics tonight. There's lots of other ones that um, we could also go into, but not enough time. And then just sort of three case, case studies, really. So um, the Avon Invasive Weeds Forum, number one. Aqua, which is um, an accreditation scheme for biosecurity. Um, the crayfish conservation work that we get up to, which involves <clears throat> um, native and invasive crayfish. And not so much of the stuff that uh, my colleague Karis and Jen get up to in terms of the um, rearing on of um, crayfish in the zoo. Um, I'm much more sort of field based and I do the field based sort of stuff and they're much more technical and more scientific than me that do the stuff in the zoo. Um, and then just a couple of sort of next steps, nothing major, but just sort of like, you know, a few things that we might be moving into and continuing or developing as we go. So generally the problem, invasive non-native species. Um, so plants and animals, pathogens that have been introduced by human action and they are causing problems in our community on our, for our biodiversity um, econo economically. Um, <clears throat> along with climate change, sorry, one second. <clears throat> along with climate change, uh, obviously habitat loss is part of habitat loss as well. It's one of the main drivers for global um, biodiversity loss. And um, this figure is very, very old, 2015, I believe. So it could be in excess of 1.8 billion per annum that is costing the UK um, at the moment. Um, yeah, that's probably more than that, but I don't think they've done the number crunching since then. And the, this is the kind of list that um, I've, experienced in the Bristol region um, or the, like in terms of the Asian Hornet, I've not experienced myself, but in the Mendips and in Tetbury and in um, Devon, we've got the Asian Hornet around us, um, but it's not something that I've come across myself as yet. And then the two at the bottom, Quagga Mussel and Killer Shrimp, uh, are ones that um, almost like horizon species, which we're expecting like almost any moment um, because they're they're moving around um, and uh, quite easily moved around. So yeah, him and him balsam, giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, floating penny, water fern, um, or a zola is more um, known by really. Zebra mussel, signal crayfish, which we do loads of work on, and Asian hornet, which I've not done loads of work on, but I'm part of um, the awareness raising of the Asian hornet, so people get to see what it what it is and um, how to identify it properly because one of the problems with that one especially is that it's often misidentified as uh, our native hornet and they get thousands of those per year um, defra and it really muddies the water so um, I'm not going to touch on that one tonight too much but uh, at all really but um, yeah that I'm part of that one as well just in terms of awareness raising and the region um, within the sort of yellow um, outline there, that is the old Avon region. It kind of doesn't really exist any longer, but um, that encompasses um, like North Somerset, Bath, um, South Gloss and Bristol region. And it's kind of the old Avon district. So um, 
that was kind of my outer limits and we're spreading further down into um, North Somerset um, and then other groups kind of look after different places and yeah sometimes you, you try and do too much but uh, in terms of spreading yourself too thinly you can't really get anything done so obviously you can see where I've been um, literally ranging from um, the River Chew and then the River Froom running in from the north um, and then the three brooks over there and so the river trim down here and etc so that's kind of where I've been working and that's not everything that's mainly him and Bolson records on there but um, there's obviously other records that uh, a bit more sensitive that I don't often put on to um, slideshows without having to ask all the all the landowners which would be a bit of a pain so in terms of um, the work I've been up to um, for the Avon Invasive Weeds Forum, so um, as you can see, it was kind of the concept for it um, was born in 2008 um, and it was a meeting with the um, local EA representative, Bristol City Council and Bristol Zoological Society and was part of the water framework directive that was a big driver um, for a lot of water based projects back then and basically a lot of the rivers in Britain or pretty much all of them were failing for one reason or another and um, one of the reasons why um, the water courses can fail is one is pollution events etc but two is um, invasive species causing detrimental impacts so from that driver it was kind of set up in 2008 and it was on a very sort of small scale and then in 2012 the funding was gained um, happily from DEFRA and that was able to employ me as a full-time um, local action group or um, conservation officer, really. Um, so yeah, so the main um, main aims really of the is a riparian survey. So it's all generally based around rivers because um, that's a really good vector for transportation of in invasive species. And so it's a really good. A lot of them have got. Um, pathways next to them and things like that so it's really easy to um, actually access them as well so to um, survey manage and reduce what we've surveyed and then to raise awareness of other species of horizon species and also of how people can um, stop spreading them around um, as well so that's the main aims and then as you can see the main areas we've worked on were smaller tributaries in um, the Bristol region, not so much actually on the Avon. I did some surveys on the Avon, but um, in terms of management, um, it's a lot bigger beast and needs a lot more, uh, different kit and you can't really use volunteers on the bigger Avon. But on the smaller tributaries, you could have definitely wins on those. Um, basically, if someone falls in, they're not just going to float downstream. They can just stand up usually on the other tributaries. So that's why we use those. Um, and then the main the main ones um, was the terrestrial um, invasives, him and then balsam, Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed. And the money over this period from 2012 until um, present day has come from initially DEFRA and then a lot of the um, waste companies. Um, so um, landfill tax sort of funding bid, so CETA and Veolia. And then um, Bristol Zoo put in a you know, huge amount of effort and was co-lead on a massive um, EU project called Rapid Life. Um, and that then paid for pretty much the last three years. And then um, now I'm um, employed by the zoo. And then the final one that um, really has been massively intrinsic, and this is what a lot of this is about, is about the people of Bristol, is the CAGS, which is the community action groups um, that are around the Bristol region. So him and M. Balsam, just a quick one. Uh, basically, the seeds explode. You can have 800 seeds per plant. It's very sappy. It's an annual, it dies back every year. Um, so one year you can have one plant, next year you can have 800 plants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's got a very pretty flower and that's why it's over here because they thought it was a, um, really good to have by the watercourses, the Victorians. It came here in sort of mid 1800s, 19th century with Victorian plant collectors and um yeah it's pretty much everywhere so if you've walked, ever walked along a river you've probably seen that one japanese knotweed it's obviously the horror story one where everyone hates to have on their land 
um, under the flowers there is actually a zigzag red stem. So that's really indicative of Japanese knotweed, a flat based um, leaf and um, sort of bamboo like stem um, down to the ground can grow. Him and balsam can grow about two meters and this can probably grow more like sort of like three, four, five meters, depending what type of species you've got. Um, slightly different species. You've got giant knotweed as well, which can be really big and the leaves can be as big as your face. And that's kind of what the problem with Japanese knotweed is. That the um, crown, which is the terrestrial um, base of the plant, expands year on year. So if that gets into cracks and into pipe work and things like that, it can um, cause problems for um, houses and buildings. And then giant hogweed, very much like our native hogweed, it looks really similar. Um, and is often misidentified um, because of that, but it's a lot much bigger serrated leaf, um, stays kind of low to the ground vegetative for about three years, four years, depending on how long, ever long the conditions allow. And then once it's got enough energy, it will then send up this massive umbilifer. And these can be like the size of dustbin lids and have potentially 50,000 seeds. And once those are in the seed bank, it's a 25 year management plan really to um, work on this. So it's a, it's a horrible beast to have. And it's the one that the sap is, causes photosen um, photosensitive burns. So you get it on your skin, the sun goes on your skin and it causes quite horrific burns that you can actually be hospitalized for. And then for three years after that, every time the sun gets on that area of your arm, it will burn again, probably uh, it gets less and less each year. Um, oh, I've skipped loads. So yeah, so that's a really bad one. Um, that causes major blockages on rivers, um, riverbanks. So you can't actually get to the riverbank because you've got to push your way through this stuff, which you don't want to do. And also the root stock on it is probably, again, sort of dustbin lid size and deep. And so when it dies back, um, it can lead to bank collapse, which is a similar thing to um, Himalayan balsam. It outcompetes our native riparian plants. It dies back and then it makes the bank um, really susceptible to erosion events. And um, it adds silt to the water and um, yeah, generally um, causes a lack of biodiversity, basically. So then so the big stars of the show of this whole project really have been the, um, the people. So the community action groups and the volunteers and we have created community action groups. We have utilized existing ones. We have utilized dog walking groups and litter picking groups. And there's some in here. The Three Brooks Nature Reserve is a really strong group that's been going a long time and they almost had their own kit. So we didn't have to give them any kit. They just went for it basically. And I think they've been working on Balsam for years before I even got involved. So that was a really easy win. Long Action Action Group was just a few um, people that saw that there was a problem and knew that there was a problem and got involved. Um, Frampton Cultural Action Group, we brought together and they formed a really good group, which then moved into river fly surveys and litter picking. I think they were more like a litter picking and um, flower group uh, initially. Park work, which is a council run um, group, which um, helps for volunteering for people that may be out of work or just want to be um, involved in the community. And they work all around Bristol, in all different um, rivers and um, parks. But mainly I utilize them in Eastville Park, just near the M32. French Action Group we created and the Malago Valley Conservation Group, that's the oldest group in Bristol, conservation group in Bristol. It's been going probably about 30 years, really strong, and we had like, massive wins with them um, in their area. Friends of Brislington Brook was a project that was just being created by Bristol City Council to rejuvenate uh, um, the Brislington Brook and Nightingale Valley and did an amazing job. And part of that was to manage invasives that had um, Japanese knotweed in there and loads of balsam. It's still got loads of balsam, but let, not as much as it was and um, much more aware of it. And yeah, and so then the volunteers, really, um, we've utilized all different groups. Um, so 
so students have been intrinsic to the whole thing. We've supported them and they've come out and done loads of work with us. Um, and then the really great one was um, the corporate groups. So people like Lloyds Bank, Eurovia, Burgess Salmon, which is a massive law firm in town, and the EA sent so many different people out. Um, and there were some of them would never worked in the, you know, in the um, sort of outdoors before and things like that. And it was really a big eye opener for them. And you really have to sort of manage the groups. There are very different um, levels of fitness and different levels of some people don't like being stung and didn't like working in stinging nettles and bramble. So, yeah, it was a really interesting, but they all got loads out of it, as I'll show you in a minute. And then this is just me giving a sort of talk, pre-talk, uh, usually about health and safety. But this is where I kind of delivered the message about invasives and the message about check, clean and dry and biosecurity. So every time I had a group out, it, it gave me an opportunity to not bang on like I am now, but just kind of introduced a few other things and um, give them something to think about. And um, like they're going to be wearing their boots in this woodland. We're going to be working in um, with Himalayan balsam. It's going to have loads of seeds in the soil. When you leave, you need to get that soil out of your boots and things like that. So it's just things like that, which they might not have ever thought about before um, when they're going to different um, woodlands and watercourses around the area. So I'm just going to go through some photographs just because I can, because I've got so many great photographs of smiley, happy people. Um, this was at the Brislington Brook, and I think this is the EA, and they were fantastic. Uh, again, this is the EA. I think this might be um, a monitoring uh, department in there. And as you can see in the front there, I've got a massive pile of um, pulled balsam. So you put it in the piles and it rots down. Uh, because it's a riparian plant, it's really good once you've pulled it out. If you just lob it on the ground again, it will just grow back up, basically. So you want to put it into piles so it heats up and rots down quickly. And you want to pull the plant before the seeds have like uh, become black in the pods. Um, so you want to get it before it sets seed, basically. And three years or ish. So they say 18 months, the, the um, seed pod, the seeds are uh, viable for Himalayan balsam. But um, if you can manage the same area for three years solidly and keep going back and picking the little ones that you've missed, maybe um, you've got a good chance of really reducing it in certain areas and making it a lot simpler, a lot more simple. Um, Frampton Cotterill group there um, is still working hard and I'm sure they're already out pulling because they even pull when the plants are tiny, which is insane. I usually wait until they're a bit bigger. But yeah, these guys are really dedicated and then a massive pile of Himalayan balsam in the Brislington Brook area as well, again. And as you can see, everyone's smiling. And I don't know why, because I've made them work really hard in, in the sun or in the rain usually, but yeah. And this is the funniest group ever. These are called Good Gym. And basically they are a, um, <clears throat> a gym group, a running group in Bristol. And they will run anywhere in the sort of vicinity of Bristol. Uh, and they'll run to you, they'll do 45 minutes of hard graft, and then they'll run off. And it's just very funny. I find the whole thing hilarious, but they're amazing. And some of them run, they do loads of graft, they do lo then they do loads of press-ups and sit-ups, and then they run off. And you just think you're nuts. So there they are, absolutely savaging Balsam at Ashton Court. And then they just run off again. And you're just like, okay, very funny. But they're very happy about it, so all good. So... It, all this energy basically is what is needed in these projects because when it's just one of you and you're like the coordinator, um, there's only you can't do anything basically. You can't go everywhere on your own and you would never get anything done. You just all these groups and people are, are what make the um, project work. Um, project work basically. And then we've got um, three sort of groups here. We've got um, Bristol and Ava Rivers Trust. They run a day and part of that day was a big part was litter picking and then a big part was um, weed pools. And sometimes we dovetail on the same day, mornings litter picking, afternoons weed pool and things like that to make to break the day up. Um, we've got a um, pension firm in Bristol City Centre, sent loads of people. This is only like about one third of them because we split them into groups because there were so many. Um, and then students that we've supported. Supported, uh, one just volunteering and two with studies and um, giving them experience and then giving them um, um, references and things like that at the end because of like their dedication and hard work that they've um, put in with me. 
Um, and then these are the outreach people. So loads of outreach, basically. I've, I'll come to the like results in a minute, but tons of outreach and presentations. And I'm not really good on sort of like Zoom, this sort of thing, because you can't really see people and you can't, can't talk to people face to face. But um, at the parish council meetings, as you can see there, you know, you're always having really interesting conversations and with all different people from all walks of life and usually really interested. That's why they're there. Um, this is an, an event I set up in Bristol Aquarium where we, they had an invasive species project um, corner in one of the main areas, basically. So as soon as you come in, it was all about check clean dry and all about in, alien invaders. And it was in there for a number of weeks through like a major summer. And then the Bristol Festival of Nature, when it was on, um, there every year and just hundreds, maybe thousands of people coming through, chatting to them, creating crayfish, talking about invasive species. So just really important and getting the message out there, basically. And then the floating pennywort people. So it's not all, it was not all just the three I've talked about. When we come across different, more novel um, invasives, floating pennywort, as you can see, basically, um, completely dominates a water course and um, kills it in the end. Um, and so the best way at the moment for us was to just manage that. And again, just two people in the community up there contacted me, which is really good, and just said, we seem to have something really strange going on with the pond in our area. Um, come up and have a look. I identified it as floating pennywort, and then we just get in and pull it out, basically. There are other methods now, a biocontrol, but I'm not going to go too much into that tonight and uh, there's the piles just next to it so you know there and then make sure everyone cleans their kit and make sure that doesn't get into the adjacent river that's the, that was what we were worried about it was going to flow down another river and there they are very happy people about having <laughs> managed their um local water course making it look lovely and then that's a good example of our native hogweed which is little and tiny compared to the giant hogweed and that's just a picture of, we had some um, funding from CETA. And what we did, we bought them litter pickers and bow saws and gloves and waders and slashers, which are sort of um, big bladed um, hand tools and a GPS. And I taught them um, the survey method and how to sort of send it to me and things like that. So that money was spent on basically kitting out new groups and um, he's probably my youngest volunteer. And then giant hogweed, um, enormous. And this is a place, um, I can't really tell you exactly where it is, but it's near Bath area in a woodland. And it was just tons of it, it was unbelievable. And it was an organic um, place. So it was a, um, a woodland project, all organic right near a lake. So we didn't want to do spraying and things like that. So we just kitted up um with full hazmat suits and goggles and hats and gloves and um, boots and we cut the tap root so about um, 10 centimeters below the surface of the soil with a spade just cut through and just downed it all and then in the foreground here is an area we did uh, a few weeks earlier than this and then in the background is an area we hadn't done so we partitioned it out and did it bit by bit so you can see it's kind of like a lot lower there and then the next slide is it down, all down, and just let it let it to rot. And unfortunately, on this day, there's us all dressed up. Um, I'll have you let you guess which one is me. I'm the one that is not a very good actor. Um, unfortunately, one of these guys ripped their trousers and didn't tell me. And as they were managing the, the hogweed, I think Sap was running off his suit down and into his leg. And he ended up like three weeks off of work there because he had actually burnt his leg with the sap because he had ripped his trousers and it leaked down in. So it just goes to show it was like, yeah, that's, that's what it can do, basically. And then the other sort of uh, really new bit of work that we were working on um, as part of the um, EU Life Project um, was... Um, the CABI and the biocontrol work. So CABI is the Centre for Biosciences Agricultural International. Um, and usually they work on pests in the agricultural industry. About 2010-ish, 
um, DEFRA saw that they could be really useful in the world of invasives and started using them to investigate um, um, invasive species in their native range and what could what actually inhibits them in their native range because in their native range Himalayan balsam is about hip height no problem it grows in small clumps and everything else lives normally with it in its native range Japanese knotweed is small is not a big beast it's got about 200 species that actually kind of inhibit it but over here it's got none of those inhibitors and so it's got a massive competitive advantage it grows and it you know nothing touches it basically so they went through a massive process of going through all those 200 species seeing which ones were um, good for a biocontrol so basically this psyllid which is called Aphalara itadori um, was chosen and it's really specific to Japanese knotweed basically and not only is it specific but in enough numbers it can actually cause enough damage to um, inhibit Japanese knotweed on its own so there was lots of other ones that were really good but on their own they weren't good enough to um, be a biocontrol and then there was other ones like some sort of rusts and things like that that were deemed when they took our native plants to Japan to um, test them in labs over there they actually caused problems on our native plants so they were discounted early anyway a massive job of working out um, what was the correct one shows this one and in 2010 it was approved for release within the UK and was initially done in very controlled sites basically with flame flowers at the ready. So if anything was going wrong, they could just burn it and things like that. And also in um, uh, netted areas. Five years down the line, they've realized that it's all good. It's causing damage when these um, areas are netted and the, there's enough of these little beasts on there that are procreating and their larval form basically saps this, um, sucks the sap out of them. So then we got involved and um, they basically delivered um, these pieces. They got a really good special license to actually be able to send Japanese knotweed through the post. So I'd get a knock on the door in the morning and there'd be a four foot um, package with Japanese knotweed inside it and loads of um, psyllids on it. And I had three sites, which was a bit nuts. I had one in um, North Somerset, I had one down in St. Ives and I had one down near Boscastle or Trevareth. And because of the nature of silly they were going to die off. So I had to try and get there, those three sites in sort of one or two days max. So it was a bit of a, a jaunt. But um, since 2015, we've released over 15,000 psyllids. And there were two problems that they were finding was they weren't overwintering. So they weren't um, being found. They were being released and they're being found throughout the summer when we were doing the surveys, as you can see there. Um, but then the next spring, there was none, and so they weren't overwintering. But on two of our sites, they had overwintered, which is a really good result and gave them a lot of hope. Uh, and then on some of them, there was a small amount of damage. When the Japanese knotweed is sleeved and they're released into the sleeve, there's loads of damage. So it, go, uh, it kind of shows that it's a numbers game, basically. If we could release more, then there'd be more damage and it'd be more controlled. So the results basically of my project oh, since 2012, I've carried out tons of invasive management days. Um, we've had a 58% reduction in coverage of Himalayan balsam along the surveyed um, rivers. The one that everyone sees is the river Avon, which we haven't done loads of work on. And, you know, it's a, just a tough one to do with volunteers because you need a massive effort. So, but on the ones that we can survey and get to, um, is a 58% reduction. Um, Japanese knotweed, 95% of what I've surveyed is under management and it's had a 50% reduction of um, surveyed um, surveyed knotweed. And then all the giant hogweed that I've surveyed is under management of some kind, is in a program of management. Um, we've done a ho over 160 awareness raising events and that includes, like I said, parish council meetings, Blah, yeah, everything basically um, and um, the check clean dry um, mantra which is one of DEFRA's big sort of, uh, mantras and projects we've shared it with over 6,500 people and um, waterway users so and that's at various events um, even like things like dragon boat racing events in the harbour um, <clears throat> the stand up paddle boarders in the harbour um, 
and they had um, triathlons and things like that. So we've got to lots and lots of people. Obviously, not everyone's going to take it on board. And this is the whole thing is you can lead a horse to water. But, you know, um, so that's this is the big problem is getting people to change their behaviours. And so, you know, it's just a continuous trip feeding and trying to get in to the big organisations like, say, um, British Canoe Club and the yacht clubs and things like that. Um, so they're bringing it down and I'm on the bank and I'm telling them up. So they're just getting um, the check clean dry and by security message continuously. Um, done over 250 um, trained, over 250 council staff, Bristol City Council and South Coast Council on identification of invasives, um, on um, sort of best practice in management. Um, increase the rapid response. So I'm now getting um, the community action groups are coming to me to say that there's problems and me not going to them. So it's quicker. Things are coming to me. I haven't got to go out and do surveys. Sometimes I'm being told where things are. And we're hoping that the rapid response is there for the alert species such as Asian hornet and um, some of the aquatic um, plants as well. Um, we've got a Bristol City Council web page for Japanese knotweed, knotweed up and running, which is massive because it took so much work and so much sort of going back and forth. It was a big, big job, that one. So that was a really big win. Um, trained harbour staff and all the groups around the harbour um, on biosecurity. Um, and that was in response to zebra mussel being found there um, uh, a few years ago. And so it was not mass it's not a massive problem in the harbour because it's kind of brackish water and they don't really like the, the saltiness, but they can take that water somewhere else if they're using a canoe in there and then they go to their go to Lake Windermere tomorrow to canoe up there. They're taking, you know, the villages of the um the larval form of the um zebra mussel with them. So it's getting them to know that they might not be a problem there too much, but they can take that problem somewhere else. Um rapid life was a massive piece of work um, for Bristol Zoological Society and the bid writers and Jen Nightingale and um, all the people associated with that. They were basically co-lead with Animal and Plant Health Agency on that and it was a huge undertaking pulling it together in the first place. And then one of the really big wins has been the cross-partnership work that we've managed to um, sort of carry out with Bristol Haven Rivers Trust, Bristol City Council, South Gloss Council, the Environment Agency, CABI, Great Britain Non-Native Species Sectariat. It's a great website. It's going to be even better on the 4th of April because it's being updated. And Complete Weed Control, which have been a great partner. And, and then the trial of the Afalara Itadori. I spelled that wrong. Um, the biocontrol has been really interesting. And I think, you know, biocontrols for some of these long-standing um, invasives like Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam it's basically the future of uh, bio, uh, of invasive control so it's been really interesting to be part of that um, process so I think that is it for the even invasive weeds from so that was kind of first case study and that's been majority of my work really since 2012. Um, case number two is a re more recent project that I've been working on um, called Aqua, and it's an equality, uh, an aquatic quality award, and it is really trying to get into the minds of the fishermen and the um, stakeholders that um, fish on and swim in and boat on the watercourses, and um, trying to get them to change their behaviours or um, to understand a bit more about invasive species and their ID skills, etc. Um, so it's a pilot scheme. It's still a pilot scheme. Um, so it's not embedded yet, but we're hoping there's interest from Yorkshire Water, which is really interesting, and um, South West Water are fully on board. Um, and it's, you know, again, it's three groups there, Bristol, South West Water, Animal and Plant Health Agency and Bristol um, Zoological Society are leading on that. Um, Jen Nightingale again, um, pulling, it, pulling it together with those um, those groups and then me delivering it out in the field on the ground with the fishermen and it's just yeah increasing biosecurity efforts um, so it's changing habits of lifetime sometimes um, which is difficult but it, it can it's very simple um, process in, in some ways and it's literally just maybe buying one extra bit of kit 
an extra set of waders or having a different way of drying and cleaning your kit before you go to another water course. So you can get bronze, silver or gold, depending on your level. Um, some sites will never get gold because they will never be able to get washed down stations and that sort of thing. So the majority of sites, um, which are just simple sort of um, fishing lakes and things like that, are going to get a bronze and um, unfortunately they can't really get much more. They might be able to get a silver if they put washing kits and things in, but um, bronze is really good. They've got to jump through quite a lot of hoops for us to get to that stage. So um, bronze is good. And I hope you like the design because I designed that as well. So my two years A-level art was not wasted, mum. Um, and then, so the people, again, what we, you know, we keep coming back to, you know, none of these projects are possible or even, you know, required really without the people. So it's the anglers are such an amazing group. They're what's one of the biggest participation sports in Britain. They're the eyes and ears. They're looking at the water course all day long. They're looking at the bank all day long. So they're a really good um, source of information, a rapid response from as soon as they see something a bit strange, even if they don't know what it is, to know the level, the way of um, escalating that um, sighting to uh, some so they become the guardians is what we're trying to do is give them the power um, to become guardians. We put in um, refuge, artificial refuge traps. So if there's any crayfish, they might use them and they can check those periodic periodically once a month or once every two weeks and send any results to me. Signs up around the lakes and um, training, the online training um, on biosecurity for the main guardians as well. So then they are in, can actually get a qualification almost in it and then uh, disseminate that down to all their members. So um, yeah, it's been really good project and still continues to be. Um, so we initially, uh, between our sites in Bristol and Southwest Water Sites, we tried for 60 sites across the Southwest um, in the accreditation and we achieved 40 with 20 sort of pending um, as long as they um, come up to standard and also some of them were a bit strange in terms of landowner um, ownership so yeah so we've got some work to do and that's the great thing about it and um, um, we've got people like Bristol Water their operatives have been trained and they've got their qualifications and then they can disseminate it to their fishers and then I know he doesn't look like a swimmer but this is a swimming lake in Bristol uh, and they're fully on board um, really good group and have actually written their own um, biosecurity protocols and so yeah really really good and really positive outcome really from that from that one and that's just more happy people with their lovely signs that's cross hands um angling club and they're you know long-standing anglers and i think they've got about 300 members so you know you can these are the guardians and then they'll disseminate it to 300 members which i would never be able to do on my own so for these guys i go and work with them i go to as you saw there um i go to the work party days and just get in the water with them and clean up their um weeds so they can fish and, like that. and then i can have conversations at that point about this rather than doing it like this and presentations with powerpoint you can just have a chat to them and i think that is a lot more powerful in many ways and then the sailors and paddleboarders. So um, this site um, actually got a silver because they've got a wash down station. It's Cheddar Water Sports down in Cheddar. And yeah, really on board. And um, they really want to go for gold. So they, they're asking me what they can do to, to go for gold basically now, which is you know amazing. So um, exactly what we wanted. Oh yeah, and that's, you can see there like the artificial refuge traps we put in, in all these water courses to um, get a sort of like little window into what's happening below the surface, basically. Main take home, check clean, dry all your kit. And that can be for aquatic stuff, but it's also for when you've been walking in a woodland. Uh, one woodland might have a completely set of different things going on than another woodland. So, you know, always check and clean your kit and dry it and, uh, and you're all good to go. And the final case study, um, <clears throat> again, um, there's a lot more going on than just these two things on the, on the crayfish side. There's a lot of husbandry and rearing on of young and things like that and arc site work that's going on with Karis, um, Holly before her and um, Jen Nightingale 
and our current student Jenna. Um, but these are the kind of things that I'm more involved in, um, which is the invasive crayfish control and the crayfish community action group, which is brilliant. It's such a good <laughs> little group. And that's Karis just a couple of weeks back in um, a lovely water course in Chew Valley area. So invasive crayfish control, it's a pilot scheme. Um, at the moment, there's no real control for crayfish. There's some things you can put um, lime, you can lime water courses, very damaging. You can um, put biocides in and things like that, very damaging. You can drain completely, very damaging. Um, it's really tough, once, especially all aquatic in, invasives. Once they are in, it's really tough to um, work out how to get them out, basically. So um, this is a two pronged at attack, really for um, invasive crayfish. So the problem is that the signal crayfish outcompetes our native crayfish for space, for food, for just because they're bigger beasts. But even worse than that, they carry crayfish plague, um, which is kind of benign for them, but will kill our white claw crayfish very, very quickly when they are subjected to it. And so much so that there's been a 70% decline in white claw crayfish populations in the Southwest, as you can see there and um, probably even more than that, I should imagine, by now. And as you, that's a crayfish there, um, modelled by Dougie, who was a student that worked with us on um, crayfish trap efficacy during last summer. And um, yeah, so real baddies in the water, they can they burrow into the riverbanks. Um, one male is supposedly can dig like 12 burrows and the burrows can be um, 30 to 50 centimetres deep. So if you've got 100 males in a bank, that's 1,200 holes in a bank. And if you've got him and balsam on top, which dies back in the winter, then you've got the bank being nailed there and nailed there. So you, you can see what they can do. They can cause um, bank collapse and increased siltation and flooding events, etc. And obviously, I don't know if any of you are aware, the National Trust Place in Bath, it's got the, I can't remember what it's called, uh, got the really lovely couple of lakes the um, dam in between those two lakes to different levels um, was so badly damaged by um, signal crayfish that they've had to drain the whole lot. And it's cost millions. Um, so, you know, if we can come up with a, a method of maybe not eradicating, but controlling uh, invasive crayfish, then this, this is, could be a really powerful sort of pilot scheme. So what we're doing is um, trapping um, the crayfish out. And we've been doing this for three years now, um, maybe four. And we put in the ARTs again, which are these artificial refuse traps. Uh, we've got a hundred of them in around the lake and we trap them out. So we've looked at populations, we've got data coming out of our ears about populations prior to putting in predatory fish. Um, and now the predatory fish have gone in, the perch, we're using perch to small perch to actually noodle around and take out the young crayfish because we trap out the larger ones in the pan pipes there, but we miss quite a lot of the smaller ones. And we're hoping that the perch, the theory is, um, is that the perch will um, decimate the small crayfish populations, which is usually make up about 80% of the population, and then we'll trap as well. And then from that data pre-perch, we can then look at the data afterwards. And we're hoping, the hope is, a population decline. Um, and so far, as you can see, we've taken out 5,000 juvenile and adult crayfish and over 6,000 eggs. And that's that 6,000 is, we always try and go low. As, you know, we don't, um, over, we don't over egg it, basically. Um, so it's probably more than that. And so, yeah, so it's a really, in, really interesting project. It's hard work sometimes because we're, you know, working in all weathers, uh, the, the lake, fluctuates in height um, and yeah it's pretty tough work but um, we're hoping now that the perching will see like the effects of it basically. Um, and then the final facet of this final case study is um, the Crayfish Community Action Group and again that's in um, Somerset, North Somerset and four years ago a uh, healthy great population of white claw crayfish were found in the region that's previously unknown. Um, 
it might have been known to the people that lived there, but previously unknown um, to everyone else around. And there was a pollution incident, and so therefore that's why they were found. And that's why suddenly alarm bells went. Okay, what if that occurs again? This very small little one kilometer stretch of crayfish might be nailed, and and that would be it. So um, it was deemed that the some work needed to be done, and um, Jen uh, and the Selfish Crayfish Partnership, which she, she's been running since 2008 with, as part of the zoo, um, got involved and got us involved, and we started surveying and found that the population was great. And now we're surveying the upper reaches above um, this area to see um, if they are suitable for um, supplemented populations to be moved from here upstream, basically. So we're spreading the um the love and then we're also finding other water courses that can act as natural arc sites that are close by that we can move crayfish into so if there's a pollution event or anything bad goes on in one water course there's a there's a population which you can pull on uh, and um it's keeping them safe basically there's a lot of work goes into that um because you've got to look at the water levels water quality um pollution events uh and pollution generally sort of from farming and runoff. And we've been recently trained by Bristol Lane Rivers Trust to um, work on the River Fly project, where you basically score a water course from the um, larval forms of flies that you find. It's a really, really simple, really powerful method, and anyone can do it. It's really good sort of um, citizen science that anyone can get involved in. Um, we're looking at what other in invasive species that rivers got. The land use around the rivers, um, the stakeholders in the area. Um, so obviously some people just won't, won't let you on. It's not really their priority. Um, and then it's all then got to go through the Environment Agency and Natural England to be um, agreed that that's, that's an arc site that can be created and used. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through, but it takes quite a while to get, get there. But when you find one, then it's amazing. And um, we thought we had one last year. And it was perfect everything was going fine and then we went back and it'd been a period of uh, very low rainfall and it was just there was no water in it it was all the ARTs that we put in the water were just high and dry so that was that one written off so it was all a bit of work that we had done um, but it was that's why we do to make sure that that you know you wouldn't want to put um, crayfish in there and then for the water to disappear so it was good that it took that long that length of time because we wouldn't have seen that occur um so Basically, um, we took 10 buried females um, in and under license, so it was all licensed. And those um, eggs, those buried females, their eggs were um, grown on. And now they're at Wingham Wildlife Park. Um, so Jen's moved them there and trained the people there to look after them until they're big enough to be re-released back into the, this area. And then the ladies, the 10 buried females, or unburied females then, were put exactly back in where we caught them in the first place. So it was really nice. We knew exactly where we, they'd come out, literally the same bit of river underneath a, some roots sort of thing. So we put them back in there. And yeah, those um, youngsters will be put back in for release um, when they're big enough. And then we're literally going out um, in the next couple of weeks to collect another um, 10 uh, um, buried females to hatch them on and do the same thing again. So it's kind of just um, making sure that the population is robust. So I think the stat is that um, in captivity, 80% of the um, eggs survive uh, compared to in their native, in their water, their 20% would survive. So you kind of like um, increasing their chances and we only take a small number. So the majority of ladies are in the water hatching out naturally. There's only a few that we take out. And then the people, again, unfortunately, it's a picture of me, um, but we have, because I haven't got a picture of the people. Um, so you just got that one to look at, because I, I look like an idiot. Um, so the homeowners in that area, along that one kilometre stretch, um, are formed a crayf um, crayfish action group. And they're now like the eyes and ears, basically. They, um, we want them, some of them, or one of them, or two of them maybe, to become river fly monitors, to monitor their water course for pollution events. And become a rapid response very much like the aqua um, uh, guardians and um, yeah to become the eyes and ears of their area and really really um, care for it and it hasn't taken much effort from us for them to want to do it they they've 
they love having them and they love that there's like a focus on them and we went um as part of a course last year jen's um crayfish course last year went and torched with a torch looking the water in the evening um we couldn't believe the numbers and the local the local action group they they literally couldn't believe it It was an amazing night of just seeing hundreds of different <laughs> aged um white claw crayfish um getting about just not hiding under the stones just walking around it was, it was pretty amazing and then this model will be used for other residents in other arc site areas so it's kind of like this is almost again like the pilot really of doing it like this because it used to be a very secretive thing and now we're kind of thinking actually actually it's probably better if it's known and the locals are more in, engaged in it rather than just us being secret about it so so yeah it's a really good positive project and again it's the people that are going to make it be sustainable and carry on and uh when my funding runs out or things like that that it will all sort of carry on or people's funding runs out so that's that one that's pretty much it for me um and so the next steps is i'm going to work on the biocontrol stuff more and really get involved in that a lot more i really want um uh, him and balsam biocontrol but it's worked out that there's actually three types of him and balsam they're all they look exactly the same they're all called impatience glandiophera but there are actually three separate types of um, balsam that need three different types of um, rust fungus, which is mental. Um, and our rust fungus in the south here is the one that we haven't got. So until we get that one, um, we've just got to keep on pulling. Um, re group re-engagement and targeting. So obviously with COVID, I know it's a horrible thing to keep banging on about, but um, it's stalled a lot of things basically. So a lot of the groups um, were of a certain age and you just didn't want to get people together and in big groups and there's no point doing it on your own so it's stalled for a couple of years we want to create a somerset invasive species community action group and get more work done down um where i am now do those 20 additional aqua sites if possible and find some more find target some more and and find some additional arc sites and just carry on and the fight goes on and that is me done <laughs> you'll be happy to hear Thanks, Neil. It's a really interesting talk. Um, I uh, didn't, didn't realise quite how extensive um, your, your responsibilities and activities were. So that was um, re really interesting for me too. I know, um, it's crazy, I know. <laughs> there's yeah, a, lot, a lot going on there. So um, I will open the floor to any question. Shall I, shall I stop sharing? Yeah, can do. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and I'll spotlight us both, in fact. <clears throat> I won't do that. Excellent. Um, yeah, so if you've got a question, you are welcome to either stick your hand up and unmute uh, or type in the chat. Um, or if you're on Facebook, I can have a look to um, see if you've typed anything there to ask as well. Um, so let's see if we get anything through. Sometimes it takes a moment. But I guess in the meantime, uh, I've obviously got a couple of questions. Um, as, as the host here. So, um, Easy ones, I hope. Yeah, no easy ones. Um, you talked a lot about how things like the uh, a lot of the invasive plants, um, like Himalayan balsam and stuff, were introduced sort of as ornamentals even as far back as sort of Victorian times. Um, yeah, yeah. Have you are, are there any sort of new uh, invasive species that are becoming more problematic that you've noticed sort of in the last ten years or so since doing this, um, or any sort of uh, ones that are on watch lists that you think could become the new Japanese <clears throat> hogweed or the new um, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, if you want to mix those up there. But you know, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, there's a few interesting ones. And I think mainly the new ones are more um, trade linked rather than Victorian, Victorian sort of um, plant collectors. So there's one, there's a lot of aquatics that are part of pet trades and things like that. That are sold um, illegally or have been sold illegally in the past and so they're much more prevalent um, and then there's things like hot and top fig we've not got in this area but um, down in the new forest they've got like really big problems with that um, and yeah I think the the big dry the big thing if you there's some graphs I didn't put into this presentation because I've been using them so many, so many years I just don't put them in um, but it shows that the the um, industrial revolution it, it exploded basically then there was movement around the world and there was trade and things being brought over so yeah so 
that was the big one, but I think still now trade links. And so the Asian Hornet obviously was brought over from China in um, pottery. So that, again, that was like a trade thing to France and, you know, not so long ago, I think it was something like 2013 or something. And it's now just it's basically spread across Europe. So, you know, um, so that's a big one. And then there's um, Ponto Caspian aquatic um, organisms like the Praga mussel, zebra mussel, um, that are literally waiting to get in. But because we've got, the, got that little bit of water, basically, it makes it difficult for them. Um, but the Quagga mussel was a recent one as well. So that was a recent, probably, you know, six, seven years ago uh, into Ra Raysby um, area in, in London. And that's slowly spreading. So, yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a funny one. I think, you know, um, with slight temperature changes as well, where we're not getting like the really um, cold winters. There might be some species that um, have been over here as non-natives that have never really developed, but now because they uh, because they're not being killed off in the winters and things like that, they might then become invasive. You know, so yeah, kind of. And this is what um, the Great Britain non-native species, species sectaria do. They're looking continuously at what's next. And they're creating risk assessments for all these new ones. And, you know, so there's a rapid response plan. Um, basically, you've got like a small window of opportunity at the start to, uh, to eradicate. Once you get past that eradication stage and you're into Hemen and Bolson, Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, the, you know, the, it's out of the box basically. And, you know, so you want to jump on things early and have a plan, quick rapid response plan. That's the big sort of mantra these days, really not let it come in in the first place if it comes in get rid of it quickly like um when the first um asian hornet was found in tetbury it took about 10 days to find it and kill the nest by then wow. you might have had you might have had females disperse um but now it's down to about three days oh i thought so, 10 days was impressive three days is certainly three days. more impressive yeah that's it's unbelievable isn't it yeah so they've got teams they've got and that's the job that they're doing up there it's about i about three or four of them sat in a room in in york <laughs> working all this out you know and doing this work you know, really you know, yeah clever, wait, wait for the call uh, out. yeah cool that's really interesting um just ch chat again in facebook um nothing through there uh guess second topic of interest then um crayfish i was gonna ask um a few things yeah. on did you say when signal crayfish first were introduced how long so, have they been a problem so they're called American signal crayfish. Yeah, sorry. So obviously from America. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, 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 I have to apologize, but, but it, it, it's kind of thing, it makes you think that they were brought from America to here. Yeah. I think they were brought from Sweden to here. Okay. Because Swedish love crayfish, basically. They love eating them and things like that. And so they imported and they made a lot of, um, they had farms and they were, the farmers were making quite a bit of cash out of selling crayfish. So I think what occurred then, I think it was in the 50s-ish, that we started to farm them over here. And then um, obviously, once you bring something in, especially aquatic stuff, uh, you've probably got ponds that are quite close to a river water source. And it doesn't take much for them to escape in and things like that. And so I think around the 50s-ish, uh, 50s, 60s, and then sort of exponential growth from there. And uh, yeah, a lot of moving around. So. I you know, there's a, there's a number of other species as well, mainly sort of around London and stuff, but I think it's Turkish and Noble. There's lots of different invasives, um, crayfish, but mainly signals the one that's kind of the baddie, the big baddie, yeah. basically. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, and just got a comment coming in the chat there from Virginia saying, um, have we just accepted <clears throat> the presence of mink? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, mink is not... A species that I've had any dealings with, but I've seen presentations and I've seen work that people have done with mink. Um, Norfolk um, Invasive Species Group have done like massive amounts of work. And again, it's a huge, big citizen science thing. So they, you've got one guy that kind of runs it, but then, um, and they're putting out mink traps. Um, I don't think so, but it's very labor intensive a lot of um 
you know, you've always got to try and work with two people. So that makes it doubly labor intensive. And then you've got to have the ways of eradic of um, dispatching them and things like that. So I think, no, there's places, people, and there's a lot of groups that are working on it. Um, but I think it's a difficult one to work on, basically. Um, it's, a, it's a bit contentious. It's like saying, you know, have we accepted the presence of gray squirrel? Probably we have, really, because it's very unpopular to go around trapping everyone's gray squirrels and and, and shooting them in the head. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't think there's a sort of like um, the want from from the general public for that sort of. You know, I, I don't like gray squirrels at all. It's, it's their gray squirrels, muntjac deer, sycamores. You know, uh, the death of our woodlands, basically all those three things working together it might not be one of them that um, kills our woodlands and kills our oaks and stuff but those three things working together is really damaging but then you know you've got to broach the subject about trapping as something small furry and cuddly and shooting it in the head <laughs> so yeah i think but mink is being managed and otter the resurgence of otter is actually doing a lot of work for people basically there's a lot more otters around recently and they move in mink on and they disrupt their sort of breeding and things like that. So if you manage the watercourses in a good manner for fish, then you'll have more otters and then your otters will move the mink on. So if you start putting things back into balance in some other ways, it might do the job for us, basically. All right, cool. Um, and there's another question that's coming now um, uh, from Jessica saying, is there anything about invasive species in the school curriculum in England? Oof, I don't Question. think so. Yeah, I'm not not that I know of. I know that in a lot of university courses that are sort of environmental based, that it's in there. And also, I was in um, I was a late late comer to sort of like the environmental world, basically. And I went to an agricultural college uh, as part of Bath University. And what was really good was that all the um, farmers, uh, the young farmers, are being taught at the agricultural college were being taught uh, lots of environmental things, basically, which probably they never used to be. And part of that was invasives uh, as well. So that was really sort of pleasing to see that the next generation of the big landowners, the big custodians, basically, are gonna have that knowledge and those skills sort of thing to um, at the very least ID it, you know? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, and then final, uh, well, not necessarily final, but comment from Sue, um, not so much asking a question, but just pointing out <clears> that <throat> there are potentially some big differences in attitudes uh, to grey squirrels in Scotland, where you still have the reds, at least, I guess, where it's not, yeah. where it's not a lost battle and people can yeah. really see the big impact on what what they're doing and um, how they're disrupting native species. So, um, yeah, lots, I guess lots of angles to consider there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, if there are no final questions, given that it is now nine past seven, um, I will probably end the session. Excellent. Um, well, thank so, you very much, people. Sorry, Thanks Google for listening. I hope you were there. Um, I sorry. Were uh, listening. Uh, anyway, yeah, thank I mean, it's really weird because I'm not look. I can't see anyone. So you're just talking to your not. presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's really strange. Brilliant. Um, yeah. But yeah, thanks very much. Um, it was a pleasure to have you um, and a really interesting and informative talk. So um, I'll see hopefully most people here in our next talk next month. And I will be sending details around in various ways um, to communicate that to everyone. So thanks again for joining us um, and cheers again to you, Neil. Um, and have a nice evening, everyone. Good night. Safe journey home, thanks. everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>